So, Chosen People Ministries and the Fog of War. As the title of my paper indicates, uh, this research seeks to explore the activities of the American Board of Missions to the Jews during the years under examination, which is mainly the years leading up to and through World War II and on into uh, beyond the war, uh, up to the point of, of, uh, of statehood in Israel. So to bring some coherency to this picture, I want to introduce my presentation by placing the priorities and the activities of the ABMJ during this time in a number of contexts. Uh, the, the extent to which uh, the ABMJ had a presence in Europe at the time, the challenges that it faced to make to stay true to its priority of Jewish evangelism, while at the same time rendering uh, practical aid to desperate Jews in their immediately in their immediate sphere of influence and elsewhere, and finally, what specific actions they took. And then, a greater context of what has been alluded to in one or two instances here is the greater context of what was going on between Jews and Christians in America leading up to this time, which is a very crucial part of the puzzle. So as the persecution of the Jews in Europe initiated by the Nazis began literally in the first weeks of Hitler's rule, quite naturally, influential American Jewish organizations, such as the American Jewish Congress, the American Jewish Committee, the Joint Distribution Committee, among others, were deeply concerned, although somewhat as, at a loss as to how to formulate a, a response, a coherent response. Agreement regarding strategy and concerted action was hampered by the simple fact that the spectrum of Judaism and Judaism's uh, Jewish ideological commitment in America was simply too broad to achieve consensus. And this lack of unity remained a factor in the American Jewish response to Hitler and Hitler's depredations before and throughout the decade in question. The pre-war developments in Germany posed a different challenge to the American churches. Uh, sympathetic Christian leaders and members of their flocks were challenged to come alongside Jews in a way that, that was unprecedented. Uh, they were thrust into a new proximity, pitted against a, a common foe. They had an opportunity to inspect each other more closely, and, and in doing so, they were challenged to achieve a degree of rapport that had been previously absent in their relations in the midst of the existing social order. So with the notable exception of the durable pre-existing relationship of Jewish and Christian Zionists, of which, you know, um, Yaakov is such a, a, a great expert, apart from occasional friendships between Jewish and Christian individuals, leaders, what we call today interfaith relations did not exist in the lexicon of American Jewish thought before the 1920s. So prior to that time, there were no official movements specifically constituted for the purpose of fostering positive interreligious discourse between Jews and Christians on the basis of mutual religious esteem. Up until that time, the language of mutual religious recognition had not yet truly developed a vocabulary. The groundwork had been laid. Um, Alfred Williams Anthony, chairman of the Federal Council of Churches, wrote a letter to a reform rabbi, Leo Franklin, president of the Central Conference of American Rabbis, expressing a desire for Jews and Christian to foster relations uh, on a greater footing of, uh, of reciprocity. And such gestures were cautiously reciprocated uh, by some Jewish leaders, although they remained skeptical. There was the concerning matter of Christian proselytizing. It's well known to Jewish leaders that the FCC had supported missionary efforts directed toward their people, which had in recent es decades escalated as a result of the migrations that we've been looking at and talking about that I won't dwell on right now. So as we have learned so far, um, the ABMJ may, of course, be said to be uh, first among equals in this enterprise or else close to it. So conscious of these efforts, 
at evangelization, Jewish leaders were adamant in demand that if goodwill was truly the goal of a Christian approach to their community, then Jewish participation in any form of interreligious dialogue was contingent on the understanding that proselytizing was off the table. And despite repeated assurances that it would be, some Jewish leaders continued to be skeptical of the FCC's motives and remained aloof. And we have the issue that Jewish leaders often express contempt toward evangelism and those misguided Jews that the evangelists were able to dupe as they saw it. And I mean, it's obvious that the efforts of Jewish evangelists clearly got under their skin for a number of reasons. But as Yaakov has noted in his work, the idea that some converts might have been persuaded by the Christian message and had embraced Christianity after much thought and inner struggle was a possibility their fellow Jews were often unable to countenance. That these missionaries perceived themselves as sincere friends of the Jewish people and saw their evangelistic work as a manifestation of goodwill and, and a manifestation of obedience to the Great Commission this they could not understand, and then he did not want to understand it. And there were some Protestants that were beginning to lose sight of this as well. The matter of Christian evangelism toward Jews and the obstacle it presented to Jewish-Christian relations were a bone of contention among Protestant churches, albeit for a different reason. And while Jews were naturally suspicious of hidden missionary agendas in the goodwill movement, some of the more conservative figures under the umbrella of the more generally theological FCC were deeply troubled by the implication that the Jewish ground rules for inter-religious dialogue required Christians to lay down their tracts and cease to carry out what they perceived to be as their religious duty to bring Jewish people, among others in general, to faith in the claims of the gospel. Conrad Hoffman, director of the FCC's International Missionary Council's Committee on the Christian Approach to the Jews and others like him, viewed such a move as a retreat, a portent that would not only undermine Jewish evangelism, but would also have a greater unwholesome effect on the church's larger commitment to world evangelism generally. So Hoffman was a highly influential figure who proved to be not only a staunch advocate of Jewish evangelism, but who also worked tirelessly in the 1930s to rally support to help Christians with a Jewish background to leave Germany. And serving at the same time as the secretary of the Presbyterian Board of National Missions, Hoffman also oversaw that denomination's work among the Jewish community. And as early as 1933, he began to publicize the rise of anti-Semitism in Poland, including a first-hand account, What I Saw in Poland, that was published as the lead article in the June 1933 issue of the Protestant Interdenominational, The Missionary Review of the World. So Hoffman was also painfully conscious of the effects of Christian anti-Semitism. And in his pamphlet, the Jews Today, a call to Christian action, published in 1941, he makes the case against Christian anti-Semitism direct, from three directions. First, he condemns it as being antithetical to authentic Christianity. Next, he underlines the underlying kinship that exists between Christianity and Judaism. And finally, and most importantly from his standpoint, Christian anti-Semitism badly damages evangelism, Christian evangelism, impedes Christian evangelism, its most pernicious effect, causing Jews to turn a deaf ear to the life-giving message of the gospel. And the ill feelings that he knew, despite the ill feelings that he knew that his views were bound to stir up among some of his co-religionists, he believed that to exclude the Jews from the church's Great Commission was in itself a form of anti-Semitism. So the rifts at this time between the liberal-leaning wing of the FCC and the more conservative-leaning wing of the FCC just began to widen and widen until this uh, 
Committee on Goodwill decided in 1927 just to branch off on its own. It was just, you know, tired of the fighting. They could see that if they were going to make relational progress that they sought with their Jewish counterparts, they must be able to convince them that as far as establishing interreligious cooperation, their goals lay where they said they did. And this they attempted to demonstrate with many soothing words. So if Hoffman was troubled by what he perceived as the prospect of a distancing among in influential Protestants from the task of Jewish evangelism, one can only th think what it, this must have meant to Jewish evangelistic ministries such as the ABMJ, which viewed uh, the terms of the interfaith project as a betrayal not only of Jewish evangelism, but of the gospel itself. And one need look no further than the lead article of The Chosen People in January 1933. And here Joseph Cohn led off with an unusually lengthy editorial that excoriates the stance of the FCC, the goodwill movement, and he names names. Names of people who throughout the 1930s and 40s would be prominent in Jewish Christian efforts to publicly and vociferously denounce Hitler and the Nazis in a mainly fruitless effort to alter the course of events for the Jews in Europe. Cohn writes, for the church of Christ has been betrayed and betrayed in the house of those who profess to be her friends. Singling out former president, Reverend S. Parks Cadman, writer of the widely read syndicated newspaper column called Everyday Questions, in which column Cohn asserts repeated that, that Parks repeatedly and frankly asserts that he is opposed to, opposed to proselytizing. Then also the well-known um, Methodist Episcopal Church Bishop, Francis J. O'Connell, whom Cohn roundly condemns for his attempts at interfaith amity at the expense of Cohn's understanding of the true gospel message. He goes on, Cohn does, to cite an article which appeared in the B'nai B'rith magazine of March of 1931, which he characterizes as nothing less than, again, a betrayal. And the article is entitled, Are Christian Missions Menacing Judaism? by Reverend Everett E. Clinchy, Secretary, Committee of Goodwill Between Jews and Christians, Federal Council of Churches of Christian America. This is another stellar name in the mainline Protestant church. He writes, but why does the Christian missionary feel compelled to approach the Jews? The Christian missionary to the Jew has the conviction, sometimes bordering on the pathological, that he has the only way to salvation. Does the goodwill movement prepare the way for proselytizing? Just the opposite. Well, you can imagine how something like this would send uh, Joseph Hoffman Cohn around the bend. So he goes on at some length, clearly agitated, at what he is, is deeply convinced is uh, a turn toward the theological wilderness with what were to him frightful ramifications. And I want to say also, uh, you know, I've immersed myself in these past issues of The, the Chosen People over the last weeks making this preparation, and, and I, uh, along with Mitch, will say this is material that never stops giving. The immediacy of some of the reports that, uh, that are in those pages that I'm going to, uh, to quote uh, a little bit later, uh, you know, they're, they're really, really grab you. They're really compelling. And Joseph Hoffman Cohn had, at times, I found, a very caustic wit and a sharp pen with which to express it. Years later, in 1948, he went on to write what he viewed as the lukewarm strategy of the World Council of Churches' Christian approach to the Jews. He wrote, these befuddled people are always approaching the Jews, but never quite get there. Well, I thought that was pretty funny, actually. It hardly needs to be said that organizations such as the ABMJ, whose missionary focus confirmed mainstream Judaism's worst fears, were shut out of participation in the interfaith enterprise, shunned by Jewish, uh, mainstream Jewish leadership and seen as a hindrance by Christians eager to find 
ground, common ground with Jewish representatives, Jewish Christians and their missions were viewed as an unwelcome, destabilizing, and disruptive force. So with the backing of the churches and other Christian institutions that supported them, organizations such as the ABMJ would have to define a role for themselves as the desperation of the plight of European Jewry intensified. So looking back at the ABMJ history, it's plain to see from the moment that young Leopold Cohn entered the DeWitt Memorial Church building on Rivington Street that Jewish missions and the support of churches were an essential partnership. Um, uh, it's a given that without the partnership of Christians, the churches and the learning institutions that they spawned the Chosen People Ministries would have been hard-pressed, to say the least, to carry out the truly impressive program of expansion that Mitch has described under the leadership of Joseph Hoffman Cohn that brings us to and through the Nazi era. And it is also true that Joseph's expanding network of contacts among church-supported missions already established in Europe would prove especially valuable during the fraught times beginning with the rise of Hitler. So allow me to turn now for just a moment to the how and when the ABMJ crossed the Atlantic and migrated, as it were, in reverse direction from America back to Europe. And one might say that the presence of chosen people ministries began to be established in Europe even before there were any workers on the scene. For just as the Yiddish language had proven such a potent international vehicle for dissemination of so many varieties of Jewish ideology, so it was that copies of the mission Yiddish newsletter, Roe Israel, the Shepherd of Israel, began to find its way into the hands of Jewish people in Europe even before our representatives got there. As early as 1923, the mission began circulating reports of Jewish faith decisions that came about as a result of the dissemination of this literature. And there it is. We saw a little picture of it before. It's a lot bigger now. This is one I just picked out of the air. So this, this we've got uh, Isaiah. Um, uh, 3423, I have established over you one shepherd, and then on the other side here, we've got um, I am the good shepherd uh, from John um, uh, 10, uh, whatever it is. Anyway, there it is. And I just picked this one out of nowhere. Happens to be from September of 1940, just a month after Leon Trotsky was assassinated in Mexico. And this article here is really sarcastic, and 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 it's very colorful. It it, it says with a with a with a split skull, um, you know, that was hacked by the hand of an assassin. Um, Trotsky. And there's a play on words here because Trotsky sort of means obstinate, stubborn. That his stubborn soul has now been released and is being embraced in the fiery flames of hellfire, uh, where he is now being embraced uh, in a way that is terrifying beyond human imagination. What are we, what's, uh, oh, okay, well, I'm, I'm coming back. <laughs> I'll just leave it here for the time being if I migrate some more. You can hear me all anyway, right? So this is, uh, this is the Shepherd of Israel. It was distributed by various other agencies and individuals in Palestine, Great Britain, Germany, Russia, elsewhere in Europe. Uh, but however, it was not until 1932 that Simon Asher, a Lithuanian Jew, was taken on as ABMJ's first staff member in Europe to begin a work in Kovno distributing the Shepherd of Israel. And this, this Yiddish newspaper was also instrumental in works that were undertaken in Russia and Latvia, although those works were uh, short-lived. So in 1934, issue of the Chosen People newsletter reports, we can never speak too highly of the incalculable influence 
of the little Yiddish paper, The Shepherd of Israel, which is now in its 16th year of service for the Lord Jesus Christ. A summary of its world distribution would include France, England, China, Austria, Palestine, Czechoslovakia, Australia, Latvia, Denmark, Romania, Canada, Poland, Sweden, Scotland, Bulgaria, Turkey. Forty different mission sta uh, stations are included in these statistical summaries, and the number of papers sent to these various missions total anywhere from 20 to 20, uh, 25 to 2,000 copies a month. That was in um, 1934. Now, in July of 1934, Joseph traveled to London to attend the Triennial Conference of the International Hebrew Christian Alliance, which was founded in Hamburg in 1925. His purpose was to enlarge the contacts amongst European leaders of the movement. And while there, he was awakened to the increasingly dangerous situation of the Jews and determined to expand the mission's presence in Europe with a large-scale relief effort to aid Jews attempting, at that time, to flee. This was before the storm clouds completely gathered. And he also strengthened ties with other Jewish evangelistic organizations, such as the Swedish Israel Mission, which would at times serve as a partner and a conduit to, for aid to those whom the ABMJ could not directly reach. So, as you can well imagine, Hebrew Christians had a particular vulnerability. Organizations such as the Joint Distribution Committee considered them Christians, therefore not Jewish any longer, and as such ineligible for aid. The Christian community, by and large, did not attend to them. Therefore, they fell between two stools, as it were, and they were without institutional shelter. So Cohn made two consequential contacts in London at that meeting. The first was Pastor Arnold Frank, a founding member of the IHCA and a leading Jewish evangelical leader in Germany, whose Jewish mission operated under the auspices of the Irish Presbyterian Church. That contact would lead Cohn to Frank's able assistant, Herbert Singer, another Jewish uh, believer who had been discipled by Frank in 1909 and had served under him since that time. He joined the ABMJ staff in 1937, and by 1940 had taken charge of the mission's Jewish refugee relief work. And by that time, Frank's work had come under the attack by the Nazis, and Frank, at the age of 80, was hauled off for a mercifully brief stay at a concentration camp. Happily, Frank survived the war, although he was taken from us too soon in 1965 at the age of 106. As you can imagine, that. that's a long life. The second contact Cohn made in London was with Moses Gitlin. And there is Moses. He had earlier in life come to faith and been baptized under the ministry of Leopold Cohn, had been educated with the mission's help at Moody Bible Institute. And Joseph Cohn and, and Gitlin had made contact over the years, and Cohn was able to bring him on staff in 1934 and open a branch in Poland. And there, in Warsaw, the mission made provision for a seven-room apartment where Gitlin and his wife Clara would minister and train other Jewish evangelists to send out to the field. So November 34, Chosen People Issue reports, now we, re we present Brother Gitlin to our readers. Many of you already know about him from the splendid reports that were published in past years. And you will rejoice that he has finally come as a dove to his original home and now is one of us, a co-worker and fellow servant. So the work in Poland was cut tragically short in light especially of the progress that the Gitlins were able to produce in a relatively short time. Amid glowing reports of well-attended meetings in Warsaw, including the establishment of a messianic congregation, something close to the heart of Joseph Kaufman Cohn, and a wide-ranging ministry in other parts of Poland, after 1936 political pressure 
uh, and increasing threats to churches that support the Gitlin's work caused those churches to distance themselves from him. And that, and you know, added to that, the increasingly violent anti-Semitic anti attacks uh, stifled the ministry in the crib, as it were. So the Gitlins departed Poland in July of 1939, and although another faithful couple, Jacob and Leah Gorin, heroically strove to continue the work throughout the war and survived the war and eventually went on to minister in Jerusalem, the war destroyed the mission's outreach in Poland. But Cohn's vision for expansion in Europe didn't stop. In 1935, he met with uh, Henri Vincent, a Baptist pastor in Paris, whom Mitch referenced briefly, whose secretary, a highly literate Jewish woman named Marie Solomon, offered to translate the Shepherd of Israel into French, and thus was born Le Berger de Israel. And that contact led to another Jewish believer, Andre Frankel, who was taken on as a missionary. And the Paris work would prove to be of enormous importance in the war, as we shall soon come to, as the situation of the Jews continue to deteriorate as the war approached. As I read all of this, there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that Joseph Cohn's desire to expand the work in Europe was fueled by the urgency that he felt on behalf of Jewish refugees. And while in Germany that summer of 1935, he saw with his own eyes the growing desperation of the thousands of German Jews who were fleeing to France. And as the situation worsened, board minutes at the end of the following year note Joseph's concern for the overseas work and linked it directly with refugee relief. So the board responded by allocating the sum of $15,000 to be dispersed during the following year. I don't know what $15,000 is like in today's money, but it's not small change. One and a half million. One, um, one and a half million. All right. Now, there are still a few more chess pieces to place on the board of continental Europe to fill out the picture of the ABMJ's readiness to respond as it did uh, to what was ahead. And one is Otto Samuel, a Jewish believer who had a short-lived ministry in Nazi Germany until he was forced to flee to Belgium, to where he established a soup kitchen in Brussels um, that fed 100 Jewish refugees each day while also ministering to their spiritual needs as, as he could. Arrested and interned by the Nazis in occupied, in occupied Belgium, Samuel endured horrific conditions until he was at last released in 1941 and was able to reach America. Okay. Yet another is Emanuel Lichtenstein the grandson of another Hungarian rabbi, Ignaz Lichtenstein, who had been convinced of the gospel after reading the New Testament and who was quoted as saying, I looked for thorns and I gathered roses. Growing up under the tutelage of his grandfather, it's, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not surprising that young Emmanuel began to follow in his footsteps and finding himself in Vienna, after having been displaced by the Nazi terror, Emmanuel met Joseph in 1936, where Cohn brought him onto the staff. And of his time in Vienna, Joseph reports, Vienna at the present time has many thousands of poor, desperate Jews that have escaped from Germany and are in a state of starvation and suffering beyond the power of language to describe. I visited some of their homes last summer and was deeply touched with the unspeakable poverty and need. And he mentioned that he sent extra money for relief to the most needy of these cases and with strict limitation that our money shall be used exclusively for helping Jews as are known to be believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to talk about money in just, just a little bit. Money and support. So before I go into some specifics about the kind of relief work that was done, I want to pose, pause for just a moment to discuss the challenges that faced not only the ABMJ, but every other Jewish agency that wanted to respond to the unfolding horror of the 30s and the 40s. So in addition to the formidable task of raising resources, came the questions of 
to whom aid should be directed and how it was to be distributed. And I just read a collection of articles assembled in a book that the Joint Distribution Committee produced, the JDC at 100, which commemorated the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Joint Distribution Committee in 1914, our kid brother. Zahava, is, her coat is in the room. I'll, I'll give her a, 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 a reference here. She has a, a very fine piece in that collection. It was a, it's a comparative study of the Jewish refugee communities that managed to find a foothold in Shanghai and in Cuba. So some of the recurring themes these essays deal with in the Nazi era is the scarcity of resources, the difficulty of getting those resources to where they were most needed, the internal strife among the various factions who vied for what they thought should be their fair share. Another pattern that emerged was a growing concern that donations were a trust that should be approached with the most responsible stewardship possible, and the related question of who qualified for help and what criteria should define that. Certainly, uh, in the case of the JDC, as I mentioned earlier, Jewish identity was a must, although there were in inevitably exceptions to that rule along the way. But the rationale was that the JDC, by definition, was a Jewish helping agency, and that is what their donors expected them to be. And in light of that, I want to look just for a moment at the constraints that the ABMJ operated on in terms of the offer of practical aid. Some things they shared in common with other Jewish aid efforts, such as an awareness of the urgency of the situation, the reality of scarce resources, the desire to use them wisely, the narrowing of the focus, at least to some extent, by prioritizing who was to be helped. And just as the JDC rationalized that other agencies were there to help the non-Jews and that helping Jews seems to be no one else's priority, and that taking care of our own is a well-recognized Jewish value, it became the priority of the ABMJ, as Cohn puts it, with the caveat that money for relief work to the most needy of these cases, and with strict limitations, that our money shall be used exclusively for helping such Jews as are known to be believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. What I've come to believe is that the money is a separate issue. That handing over money, yes, would be to believers, but by no mean was practical aid to be restricted to, to, you know, to believing Jews, naturally. Um, you know, why else were we opening all of these soup kitchens and so forth? But, you know, the disbursement of money to needy people is a much more, even to this day, is a, is a much more complicated question than some people like to make it out to be. So, as I mentioned earlier, Jewish believers were in many eyes neither fish nor fowl. They had even fewer options to help than regular Jews. Uh, there is a wider issue that bears upon the foundational, the foundational principles of evangelical missiology when it comes to the relationship between evangelism and practical aid. And this relationship made especially relevant in these circumstances between work of evangelism and practical relief. And with regard to Jewish missions, the question is taking place at this particularly anxious moment in American history that I alluded to, alluded to earlier in the context of larger conflicts having to do with the priorities of the church itself, the battle for the Bible, and so forth. In short, the work of the Great Commission, once seen as a given, was now perceived to be under attack. And one unfortunate and perhaps unintended consequence of this was a growing bifurcation in some quarters between evangelism and the work of practical assistance. So if the growing social gospel movement in America that emanated from the liberal wing and which some perceived as coming at the expense of saving souls, privileging deed over word, the mission-minded and their donors who supported them were perhaps in danger of overreaction by falling into the opposite error of neglecting deed 
in its zeal to uphold word. And this issue came to the fore uh, around 1934 when the idea was bruited about the membership of the IHCA uh, for someone to purchase land for a colony, either in Israel or elsewhere, for Jewish believers to flee to. And this idea was only to founder on the reluctance of some of the members to use funds raised for evangelism for other than that designated purpose. And to no affair avail, Sir Leon Levison, then president, argued, the idea that money is only to be used for evangelizing is all wrong. We cannot get money to bring people to Christ and let them die. But with the history of kindergartens and medical clinics and educational programs deeply ingrained in its culture from the very beginning, the ABMJ was able to plot a course amid these conflicts with the condition that practical aid must be accompanied by a gospel witness. As Cohn concisely phrased it in the October 1939 Chosen People, it may be important to stress here once more that we are not a relief agency nor a refugee society. Ours is a God-commissioned work of presenting the message of salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ, and this we do in season and out. Refugee relief we use only as a means to a vital end, the salvation of men and women. Frankly, we are not interested in relief work for its own sake. But having said that, not only did the ABMJ attempt to nourish the souls in those harrowing years, but to meet the needs of bodies, the bodies they inhabited, as best it could. So with a presence now established in Poland, Paris, and Vienna, and a man in place in Brussels, the ABMJ braced to meet the challenge of the influx of fleeing refugees uh, amid the tightening vice of Nazi occupation. They ministered as they were able, for as long as they were able, both before the war and in some instances, even after the commencement of World War II, which virtually cut off European Jewry from even the most basic forms of assistance. And as Mitch mentioned earlier, plight of the refugees did not cease after the, uh, after the war was ended, after Hiroshima and after the Germans surrendered. The plight of the refugees continued beyond World War II. And uh, that plight was constantly being brought front and center before the, reason, the readership and the supporters of chosen people. So reports over these terrible years disseminated through the chosen people newsletter offer accounts that retain their immediacy to this day and offer a glimpse into the small victories that the ABMJ was able to uh, achieve. So in 1939, in November, Chosen People reports, in spite of the war conditions in Germany, the Nazis have left unmolested the work in which we have a share in Vienna of old Austria. The Jewish mission with which we are affiliated there is maintained by the brethren of the Swedish Missionary Society, and goes on to say how highly Mr. Lechtenstein has endeared himself to those poor Jews, hundreds and thousands of them, how he has been able to organize by means of a staff of 12 volunteer workers, a beautifully systematized program of visitation, relief, employment seeking, refugee emigration, hospital care, and many other activities to looking after what is really an overwhelming task. So Lichtenstein persevered as long as he was able and only four months later Chosen people reported that as the Nazi de deportations of Jews continued, our friends are asked especially to pray for our missionary in Vienna, Reverend Emanuel Lichtenstein. We are doing our utmost to get Mr. Lichtenstein out of Vienna and transfer him to some South American port, such as Buenos Aires, where he can continue as our missionary. And, uh, and indeed, his uh, his... His rescue was effected, and he did go on to service in that sphere. 1939 to 1941 were busy years for the ABMJ. And as Cohn reports, when we were in Paris last summer, 
we eagerly seized an opportunity that the Lord provided to us, a dear Christian woman, a member of the Aglisse Evangelique, the, uh, the evangelical church where our parish branch is located, uh, found a widow possessed of a chateau some 300 miles south of Paris. The grounds are spacious. They make a beautiful picture. And she said to our worker in, in Paris, here I am, a widow with a comfortable home and no occupation to keep me busy, and I do want to serve the Lord. If you can use the property as a home for some of the dear children of your Jewish Christian refugees, you are welcome to it, and I will further devote my own time and strength to help in such a work. And there it is, 12 children in the home. They are a happy lot, far removed from the heartaches and burning memories of the cruelties and sufferings heaped upon their helpless bodies and souls because of the Nazi evictions. The parents are in Paris being looked after by our workers. A home for Jewish refugee children in Nélion, France. And there it is. It's like a lovely place. Cohn, Cohn goes on to write in an unmistakably heartfelt manner about the destitute Jewish refugees in Europe. And he says, in God's mercy, we have been allowed to bring to bring relief to hungry stomachs as well as to hungry hearts, and authorized uh, each city, Brussels, Paris, and Vienna, uh, to establish a soup kitchen or a food depot. And the plan is to have a simple but substantial noonday meal, perhaps a bowl of beef stew and some bread and coffee. After the meal, there will be a regular gospel service with testimonies following, for the one is to feed the body while the other feeds the immortal soul. We got the next one coming up. And there's a picture of the soup kitchen work in Brussels. Very good. So in addition, some of the direct ministry cone references at the time, we can also note requests that came from some far-flung places where the ABMJ had no presence at all. From Bolivia, for example. Here, too, refugee Jews from Central Europe have come, desperately seeking to find a place of shelter in a world which wants them not. So there came to us an SOS from our friends of the Bolivian Indian Mission asking for an immediate grant of tracts in Yiddish, Gospels in New Testament. And we were so happy to be able to respond without delay, just as we responded previously to similar calls from Shanghai, from Mexico, from Iceland, many other quarters of the earth where Jews have trekked to find a place upon which to set their feet. As well, escape from Europe became increasingly a matter of life and death. And the ABMJ became more politically involved. For example, the Chosen People issued a call to its readership to volunteer to provide what were called affidavits of support. It says, we are besieged from Europe with pitiful letters asking that we provide affidavits of support so as to enable destitute Jewish refugees to come to America. An affidavit of support is a form which anyone in America can sign in which the signer agrees to be responsible for the support of the family for whom he is signing up for, guaranteeing that the family will not become dependent upon the United States government. And we also give you our mission guarantee that any such families that will come over because of your affidavit will be cared for by the mission and that you will be protected by us against any possible claims. Now, with the doors of Europe slamming shut, as the fog of war descended, the ABMJ was forced to place its emphasis upon refugees that had managed to escape before the door closed, especially those who managed to make it to America. Such as this group that gathered for Thanksgiving, 1942, says that blessed brethren of our Lord, who in his great mercy escaped these has in their great escaped the cruelties of Nazi persecution and found shelter on the blessed shores of America 
many of these brethren may never again see their loved ones. And by 1943, the ABMJ experienced the same sense of helplessness that had descended over other deeply concerned Christian or Jewish organizations as the unfolding horrors engulfed European Jewry, as the question, what can be done, reverberated over and over. And at this point, Cohn wrote, and from the saddest depths of our heart, we can only answer the dear child of God, this is the most important thing you can do, pray. For the moment, nothing material can be done. There is no possible way to get money into the hands of these miserable victims of demon hate. There is no way whereby we can rescue even one family from the clutches of Hitler's maw. And this sense of helplessness was widespread. And I want to mention, here in 1943, in April, this is one of the few instances where I find any reference in the chosen people to activities beyond the scope of its close co-religionists. And it comes in connection to the closest thing I could find to a printed affirmation of Jewish statehood in the Cone years. And it comes in the form of a reprinted address called, entitled, Calling All Jews, What About the Fifth Freedom? And it was offered um, at one of the sessions of the Second New York Congress on Prophecy held at Calvary Baptist Church on December 5th through 12th, 1943 by C. Gordon Brownville, a pastor of Tremont Temple Baptist Church in Boston. And he writes, 30 centuries ago in Egypt, thousands of Jews sat in mourning with bowed heads and cried unto God for deliverance. On March 9, 1943, a repetition of some degree of that former experience took place. 40,000 men and women at two separate observances of deep mourning sat in Madison Square Garden and bowed their heads. The lights went out, even as in suffering Europe, where two million Jews already had been slain by the hand of Hitler and where four million more await the same terrible fate of the oppressed. And there's Madison Square Garden. Here is the, and there it goes. No, here is, this is the, the one little brief intersection of this paper with my dissertation work, because this was one of the events that I looked at very closely, where Jews and Christians were gathering together to help to, to, to raise the alarm. And this is the first time, actually, they actually had to add a second performance Twice in one night, 20,000 was, was the um, capacity. They got 40,000 for two presentations. This is a pageant called We Will Never Die that was put on, uh, was concocted by Ben Hecht, who was a, uh, an A-list screenwriter in Hollywood and an ardent revisionist Zionist. Uh, who uh, he wrote stuff like uh, Gun Gadin and The Front Page. Some of you may be familiar with those films. I'm sort of a film buff. And Kurt Weill wrote, uh, wrote, wrote work with it. He, he wrote Three Penny Opera. And, um, and you show the next one, too. So this is a little bit, this was in Hollywood Bowl. They took this thing on the road. And you see the, the tablets of the Ten Commandments, and these are the voices of the dead. And it was, um, it was, and this pastor referenced it to what he called the fifth freedom, riffing off of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's 1941 speech of the four freedoms, which became very famous, enshrined in the American Judeo-Christian heritage, so to speak, that was invented, actually, at this time. And the, what was it, the four fears, freedom from fear, freedom from want, freedom of expression, freedom from worship. And what is the fifth freedom? This freedom has to do with the United Nations promise of the freedom from future persecution and the recognition of Palestine as a national Jewish homeland. So that is really the closest, most you know, resonant affirmation of Jewish statehood. And it, uh, ironically, it comes in the words of a, a Baptist pastor that's quoted quoted in The Chosen People. So this brings me now to the final element of my presentation, which is the development of the, um, 
the ABMJ's attitude towards Zionism over the time frame we've looked at. Because as we know, in its earlier days, Zionism was a minority ideology. It was opposed by Jewish communists, Jewish socialists. It was opposed by some of the Orthodox. It was opposed by the Reform. It might come as a surprise that although the ABMJ had an abiding interest in the ministry of Palestine, it reported over it time and time and time again in The Chosen People, in, even as it was hiring Frank Boothby, who distributed the Shepherd of Israel in his Gospel Gate ministry in Jerusalem, and who became a member of the ABMJ staff in 1933, nonetheless, Cohn had these strong words to say about the prospect of statehood. He writes, any Jew who has been born again and become a member of our Lord's body, the church, has no further interest in Jewish racial or nationalistic schemes, which the Palestine Zionist movement, frankly, is. Now, those are very strong words, are they not? And he goes on, and he goes on to say, every so often we come across attempts to start something distinctively Jewish Christian. Sometimes it is to be a Jewish Christian church as distinguished from a Gentile Christian. This was the heart of the matter for him. Well, let me get to this because it's important. This, of course, is unscriptural, for in the word of God is always the church, a church composed of both Jew and Gentile, who, because he broke down the middle wall of partition, between the twain have become one. So we see that the opposition to statehood, as it is expressed here, is not a matter of politics, or even, as it were, with the Satmar Hasidim, so much a matter of messianic timing, but really, as it is presented here, a matter of ecclesiology. Let nothing threaten the unity of the body, one body. Yet we know that there is an ambivalence here because we, we find Joseph in favor of messianic congregations. And it's an ambivalence that goes all the way back to, to Paul's writing where he says there is no Jew, no Greek, no male, no female, no slave, no free. But of course, we know these categories still exist. But in light of the larger identity into which believers are called, these borderlines um, become relativized. And these borderlines become, they remain what they are in this world, but they are conditioned and informed by an identity that has is yet to be fully revealed. Well, another pitfall the ABMJ had to navigate around was the problem of illegal Jewish immigration into Palestine. And here you really see the change that chosen people went through, that, that, that Joseph Hoffman Cohn went through in his attitude toward the British. He starts out, they're very respectful of the British. He basically says, your mission is doing what we can to help these poor, miserable, and destitute human beings who are landing on the shores of Palestine. But what we can do seems so small in the face of the appalling lead that we find ourselves bewildered and staggered. And staggered. Let's, let's show the next one here. You who? So we have some pictures of needy, displaced Jewish refugees attempting to enter Palestine. Um, but Cohn is very, very plain at this point, where he says, that uh, we're not going to help illegals. We're willing to help all of the ones that come in legally, but we're not going to help those that are. We would have no part in illegal entry. And here in America, the Jewish community was vociferously protesting the callous indifference of Britain toward refugees who were literally caught in a death trap, including, um, including another rally in Madison Square Garden in protest of the, the British in 1946. And I want to just take a, a personal moment here. That after my parents were deceased, I came across a cache of about 
150 letters that they had exchanged during the war years. Oh, my father was in the service, and even beyond the war years, he was still stayed in the Merchant Marine to serve out his hitch well into 1946, even after they were married uh, in 1945. And my mother, who was the most apolitical, I never had a political discussion with her in her life, but here is my, my 23-year-old mother after she is complaining, sorry, Menachem, that she has to go visit the dentist the next day. <laughs> serious. <laughs> complaining to my father. She just puts this, this little note in. Went to a Palestine rally last night and have decided to hate Britain with all the fire in me. Remind me to tell you about it when I feel like it. But I don't have anything more but... Those are, those are, uh, and I looked, you know, I looked it up, sure enough, when I, you know, this was, this was the night of the, the anti-British, uh, anti-white paper rally that, again, was an attempt to um, help the Jews. So let's have another one. It's 1946. Um, Joseph. Joseph embarks on a tour of Europe and Palestine. And here's the big change for him, where boy, he was so respectful of Britain, so respectful of the laws of Britain. He wrote, you remember we stated in May that we, that we might have to, um, well, you know, he goes on. Uh, let, let me just jump ahead very quickly. Get to another one here. This is the celebrated or reviled uh, exodus, the ship, the exodus. It was a terrible, terrible scandal where, you know, they were trying to deliver thousands of refugees. The Royal Navy intercepts this ship practically on the shores of Palestine, turns it around, and sends it back to Germany, where these Jews are stuck in camps uh, where they were held. And you can even see some of the damage that was done. And the scripture... I, I am very sore displeased with the nations that are at ease, for I was but a little displeased that they helped forward the affliction. A direct scriptural condemnation of British policy toward Jewish refugees and how they are being herded back into their camps. <sighs> and Cohn goes on to write in 49, it can now be revealed that while the population in the two camps apparently remained stable, and the British authorities thought the Exodus people were settling down for the winter in Germany. Actually, these were people on the march, and nothing could stop them. In little groups, they crawled out of the British camps and went down through Europe to secret ports in Italy and France, climbing on Agana's tiny fishing boats or large converted ships, and traveled the whole underground journey to Palestine, knowing the way might lead them to Cyprus, knowing they might be killed, knowing the British might capture them again and send them back to Germany, yet knowing that the British could not break them. Even so, one item that did not make the CP newsletter was the Declaration of Statehood. Couldn't find mention of it. Joseph Cohn was mum. In his mind, the Zionist dream was a pipe dream beneath his notice, it would seem, and doomed to fail because it would not take into account the authority of the king of kings. So how to sum up? Facing the unimagined challenges posed by the onslaught of the Nazi atrocity, the ABMJ responded as best it could, maintaining a balance between its primary focus of bringing the message of eternal life to its beloved Jews with the practical aid that was necessary to maintain their lives in the midst of the threat of sometimes imminent death. The members of its staff who acted so selflessly and gave so sacrificially serve as an inspiration to us to remember and to live up to their legacy. No, I can take a I can take a couple of questions. We gotta leave in about ten minutes, and then actually we leave at a quarter after three. It says, but I'll take a question. Go ahead. 
just a couple of things. Uh, you mentioned Jew, Jew and Gentile as categories that are destined to be transcended in a manner yet to be identified, or words to that effect. I want to take exception to that. I think that's a Neoplatonic mindset that we're eventually going to ascend to a non-corporeal sense. I believe that Jew and Gentile are categories that can be demonstrated that persist into the eschaton. There's a book by uh, Arkan del Sulin called uh, The God of Israel and Christian Theology. And he uh, studied under Hans Frey at Yale, and he makes that point that, that, Jewish, that the Bible never speaks of humankind as undifferentiated humanity. It only speaks of humankind as uh, Jew, Jew and Gentile, and that that's a category that persists. So I want to take exception to that. I'm not asking, to, I'm, I, I just want to raise the point. I want to say this other point, though, that's more morally significant, and that is the idea that, uh, that, that uh, Cohen, I guess it was Leopold, said that we're not a relief agency, we only give social aid if we have the opportunity to share the gospel with people or something of that sort. In my opinion, that's something that's really great for the mailing list. That's, what? that's for the mailing list. That's to please the mailing list. But I feel it's morally repugnant when, when Zacchaeus, when Jesus finds Zacchaeus up in the tree, Zacchaeus repents and he says, I'm going to give back uh, the money. If, if I've defrauded any of it, I'll pay him back four times, et cetera, et cetera. Were those good deeds or were they only good deeds if Zacchaeus could also preach the gospel to them at that time? We all know the answer to that. So I think that's also something we have to guard ourselves against. Uh, um, I think that... Uh, a dying person is a dying person. A needy person is a needy person. And if if you don't feed them, then you're never going to get a chance to present the gospel to them. And feeding the poor from the vantage point of Torah, taking care of the off the widow and the orphan and the, the sojourner, is not contingent upon you giving them a pitch. That's right. Well, you just try out again. You know, um, you know, that's do my good point. Those, do good to those. Do good to those first of the household of faith is a is a verse that that keeps coming up in his exhortations. And I I, I was speaking specifically of gifts of money that they were never going to like withhold bread from anybody that uh, that came to them. I don't think. But um, and and these categories in the midst of the over. Overwhelming, overwhelming suffering. These these categories inevitably break down. They 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 have to, and you know that's the way it is. The heart, the, the mind may, the theological mind may say one thing, but the the heart says something completely different. Well, you know, some of it was undoubtedly, I think you hit, you hit something. It's some, some of it undoubtedly was donor maintenance, you know, and, and because of the same, the same sources of suspicion that I, re that I referenced in, in, in my work, that uh, people were afraid that, uh, that supplying material lead, need was uh, coming at the expense of the purity of their message. I don't think it was a bifurcation. No, but there, there was perceived to be. Yep, right. Any, 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 thank you. Uh, anything else? Anything else? I just wanted to mention it's, uh, uh, Charles Feinberg had exactly the same attitude towards the birth of Israel, too. And Charles Feinberg did. Yes. So, uh, pardon? Towards what? Towards the birth of the state of Israel. And, and it, it, this, this was a, an issue amongst dispensationalists, particularly. That, and, and so, it, in a sense, uh, 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 Joseph Hoffman Cohen is actually uh, holding the dispensational line in yeah. his attitude. We were doing, we were, we were having a talk. Somebody ought to do a paper on uh, when the switch, you know, when, uh, you know when, when the switch came and the ABMJ and Chosen People Ministries became such full-throated uh, supporters of, uh, of the Jewish state. Uh, Peter, you got something? Is this a, a parallel to like kind of the the Hungarian Hasidic attitude towards uh, towards Zionism carried over into 
uh, I mean, also like this, that's the same thinking. Like it's not the secular Zionists who have to have to establish the the state of Israel, but Messiah has to bring the exiles back. Is there a similar way of thinking here? Well, I, would you repeat the question? <laughs> okay, the, the Hungarian uh, like Orthodox, they think like they were against Zionism because it's a secular enterprise. This is they think. This, uh, the bringing oh, yeah. back of the exiles is what the Messiah has to do. Is there a similar way yeah, of thinking well, with Hoth, that, with, they, they're, with they're Cohen? against the same thing, but for, but for different reasons. Uh, although, yeah, well, I guess if you could talk about Satmar ecclesiology, uh, you know, there, there would be uh, a, similar, a similar thing. 